invocation. And tonight, we have Reverend Julie Norwood from the Big Life Church and her son, Kendall. And uh, they'll be doing the invocation. You're not uh, required to uh, participate, but you're uh, invited to. And then immediately following the invocation, we'll have the Pledge of Allegiance. Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Um, thank you for letting us be able to all be healthy and come here and meet to decide the decisions of the, of the uh, city. And please let everybody make the right choices and let the city become a better city. And I'm not saying that it's not, just let it become even better than it is, Lord. And um, please bless everybody here and um, just let them, let them be prosperous. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Kendall. And now we will we'll, uh, go to the adoption of the agenda. Motion by uh, Scott and a second by Wright. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say no. Motion passes. Now on to awards and recognitions. Tonight. Here, there you go. Oh, now, now it's all better. Our uh, veteran of the month uh, uh, this month is Dr. Brad Morgan. Are you here, Dr. Morgan? Come on up, please. In partnership with the Veterans Coordination Commission, we are pleased to present the October 2015 Veteran of the Month honor to Dr. Brad Morgan. After graduating from the University of California at Berkeley in 1968, Brad Morgan began basic training at the U.S. Army's Fort Lewis in Tacoma, Washington. He remained there for advanced infantry training, excelling in machine gun marksmanship. He received further training as a combat medic training at Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, Texas, having previously worked on emergency ambulance summers as a civilian in San Diego. While at Fort Sam Houston, he received word that his brother Ron had been killed in Vietnam combat as part of the U.S. Army's 9th Infantry Division. Brad was sent to the U.S. Army 2nd General Hospital in Landstuhl, Germany, where he became part of an experimental computer project headed by IBM, but focused on solving problems for the military. He was a systems analyst focused on the capabilities of rapidly emerging mainframe technology. Wife Barbara worked as an Army civilian RN at the hospital. After leaving the Army in 1970, Brad served in standby Army Reserve for a while and completed his PhD in English at the University of Denver, then moved to Fountain City, Wisconsin, on the Mississippi River, where he worked as the Director of Research in Government Relations at St. Mary's College in Winona, Minnesota, and then at the University of Wisconsin in Eau Claire, before becoming Associate Professor of Humanities at the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology in Rapid City in 1982. At the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology, he was received three faculty awards from Governor Bill Janklow for teaching with technology in the interdisciplinary sciences program. He was a leader in bringing computers and distance education to the campus, serving for a while as administrator of the campus faculty development program. 
Retiring as Professor Emeritus in 2005, he and an Army friend who had written a book on his experiences in Vietnam gave workshops at the Rapid City Public Library on helping veterans write up their military experiences. This became the monthly Black Hills Veterans Writing Group, which has met every month for now for over 10 years, first at the library, then at Western Dakota Technical Institute, and now at Ellsworth Air Force Base's South Dakota Air and Space Museum. The Black Hills Veterans Writing Group has a website at battlestory.org. Mr. Brad Morgan served our country with dedication and sacrifice and continues to serve our veterans, making him an excellent choice as October Veteran of the Month. On behalf of the citizens of Rapid City, we would like to extend our gratitude. Now we have our Yard of the Month Award. Yeah. Kathy? Is Tim Erickson here? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Tim Erickson was nominated by, actually, by Darla for Yard of the Month. They live on Brookside, and it was a regular walking area for Darla, and, and so she's put in the recommendation. Um, I had not, I have not met them yet. Um, took pictures as um, hopefully neighbors didn't call and wonder what that strange woman was doing taking pictures. But anyway, um, they receive, she will receive a um, yard of the month that they can put in, the, in their window as well as an award that was signed by the mayor and um, by Jeff Beeler. Uh, as well as a $25 gift certificate from uh, PlantSmith. And also we want to acknowledge that for the July's winner, Suzanne Carl, she was also given the award of um, the Green Glove Award. It re she receives a $25 check from Rapid City Garden Club. Check with that too, yeah. If you want to, that would be wonderful. Let me get oh, you the check. Question. Thank you so much. You now, Eric Hikus, come up. Now we have a sustainability award presentation. This is Eric Hikus, the chairman of the Sustainability Committee. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, it's my distinct pleasure as the chairperson of the Sustainability Committee uh, to give you a little bit of an overview. A big part of what we're doing as a committee in the community is part of a three-tiered effort, uh, starting with the word celebrate, to celebrate what we're doing well and sustainable in our community. One of the ways we do that is showcasing uh, projects that are very exemplary in resilience or sustainability, and we have one of those such um, great recipients here tonight. Um, I first want to read to you our mission statement. Um, the purpose of the Rapid City Sustainability Committee is to encourage education, stewardship, and policy leadership that will make our community a leader in economic, social, and environmental sustainability. I would like to ask Don Martinez, he's our liaison for this award. Uh, each of the members of our committee get to take on this role from time to time. Don has been our liaison for this particular award and he'll tell you a little bit more about it and then he'll make the presentation. Thank you, Eric. 
The South Dakota Game Fish and Parks Outdoor Campus West has been selected as the recipient for the October 2015 Rapid City Sustainability Award. This is an award that is presented for projects that demonstrate sustainability in the community of Rapid City. The Outdoor Campus's uh, mission is to provide education about outdoor skills, wildlife conservation, and management practices of the South Dakota Game Fish and Parks to all ages in order to preserve our outdoor heritage. The campus includes a main building with indoor and outdoor exhibits. Game Fish and Parks also occupies office space on the north end of the building. Indoor features include a 4,600 gallon fresh water aquarium and several wildlife models. The building also has class and meeting rooms where educational programs and events are held throughout the year. An outdoor pond at the entrance to the building provides an opportunity to try their classroom skills at fishing, canoeing, and other activities. Visitors can explore 32 acres of trails featuring wild, edible, and medicinal type plants. The Outdoor Camp Campus West has been awarded the gold certification uh, standard for green building design under the leadership in energy and environmental design, the LEED system. The buildings are heated and cooled using a geothermal heat pump or ground source heat pump system. This system transfers heat to and from the ground. It uses the earth as a heat source in the winter or a heat sink in the summer. The design takes advantage of the moderate temperatures in the ground to boost efficiencies and reduce the operational costs of heating and cooling. Now funding for the Outdoor Campus West came from the state of South Dakota fishing and hunting fees and other private donations. The years of planning, fundraising, and public and private support made the entire project completely paid for by the time, by the opening day of the campus. The sustainability finds this project a wonderful example of economic, social, and environmental sustainability that is as easily accepted or accessible in Rapid City. Accepting the award is Chad Tusing, Outdoor Campus West Director. Okay, and that's all of our awards and recognitions. And now, uh, folks, we're going to need to go into executive session for a few minutes to uh, discuss personnel matter pursuant to SDCL 1-25-2. Uh, can I have a motion to go into executive session? Uh, get that? Okay. All those in favor, say aye. aye. Opposed, say no. Okay, we'll be in executive session. It'll just take a few minutes.
like to make a motion to uh, approve the um, adjustment to pay as per the instructions of the fire chief and uh, staff. Is that correct? Okay. Effective November 1st. Thanks. Okay, motion by Lewis, second by Wright. Uh, Jerry, do you need to talk? Okay, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Now we're on to general public comment. A time for the members of the public to discuss or express concerns to the council on any issue not on the agenda. Action will not be taken at the meeting on any issue not on the agenda except by placement on the agenda by unanimous vote of the council members present. And uh, we have one speaker request form for the general public comment, and that is Dan Tribby. And Dan, you have uh, three minutes. Thank you, Mayor. I'm Dan Tribby. I'm with Prairie Edge here in Rapid City. <clears throat> and um, been working with the uh, Lakota Nations Invitational uh, Board again. Um, as most of you remember, a little bit of rough water earlier in the year, but there's so much that's been smoothed out. Um, I think Rapid City just deserves a huge round of applause along with the reservation communities for the wonderful work that they did with the Black Hills powwow this year. It was such an unbelievable success uh, to the point where it is rivaling and maybe even surpassing uh, Denver March powwow, which is a huge, huge deal. And, just want to congratulate everybody from that board and, and everybody that got on board and uh, supported that. We had a reception for the LNI board and the sponsors and city government back in April or May and uh, promised those folks that we would go ahead and do that again in October or November and, and just kind of keep the juices flowing for sponsorship and just awareness of what Lakota Nation's Invitational brings to the city. <clears throat> and we're uh, we're going to go ahead and have that reception down at Prairie Edge on November 12th from about 5 to 7.30. And uh, just like to issue a, an invitation to, to the mayor and to all the council members and to the general public, sponsors, people that want to get on board with this great event and, and help those folks out to just continue to make this a success that it is. And, um, I'm at work pretty much every day, so if anyone has any questions or, or input or would like to get in touch with any of the Lakota Nation's board, uh, I'm available to do that. But, uh, you know, again, thank you so much, Rapid City and all the reservation communities for making uh, Black Hills Wachipi such an unbelievable success. Uh, people came in groves, and there was just nothing but a lot of good feelings there, and it was, a, it was just a great event to be part of. So. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> and another speaker request form from Susan Nolan. Again, you have a three minute uh, time period. And I'll be glad to stay within that three minute time period, Mary Allender. I am Susan Nolan, and I want to piggyback on what Mr. Tribby said that the city has done a good job of being welcoming and uh, friendly and open to our native brothers and sisters. And along with that has been the community conversations that has certainly done a lot to improve relationships. And that is uh, a segue into what I want to talk about is that another step that I would ask the city to take is to allow people to ski on the, the golf course. My husband is a, a golfer, I'm a golfer, and we're both skiers. This is community land. This is not going to open the door to droves of people skiing on the, on the golf course. In fact, there's a concern that skiers will damage the golf course. Having been a golfer for a long time, and my husband Ken is also a golfer, who really damages the golf course is golfers by the big divots that they take when they hit a ball, and often people don't replace those. That doesn't happen by people skiing on the golf course. And the last thing I want to say about this, Ken and I have skied on the golf courses probably for the last five or ten years. We've never seen another person out there skiing. So 
It isn't like if you were to continue this openness that you have created with the powwow and welcoming people to use our assets and resources that we would have um, people lined up to try to get on a golf course, which stands fallow, stands empty, stands unused during the time of winter when it's shut down. So I'd like you to really think about that. There are senior citizens who, like Ken and I, who don't want to drive an hour and a half to go to Eagles Cliff. This lessens the carbon footprint. It encourages people to get out and be active in our community. And it makes use of our, our local resources. So I would encourage you to really rethink this whole position. And I don't know what your position is, but I know there's a, some opposition about that. And we would love to have you make that available to those of us who like to get out and get some exercise in the winter. Thank you. Thank you. And now another speaker request from Tony Martin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My comments are directed, Mr. Beagler, is Mr. Beagler here? My comments are uh, directed to Mr. Beagler regarding cross-country skiing on our Meadowbrook golf course. I have skied for over 25 years in the mountains on Saturday. Many Sunday afternoons, if we've had fresh snow, it's almost spiritual to go out and ski along the river with the ducks and the chittering birds and whatever. My 65 pounds, one 65 on each ski, I assure you, on frozen land, does not damage the golf course. That is a beautiful golf course. I wouldn't damage it for anything. But is it to be only used by golfers for five or six months a year? I think it's a, a beautiful facility that should be used many, many months of the year. At, and like uh, Susan said, it's, it, Mr. Beagler, do you ski? Good for you. If I didn't have this, this diamond willow, I would take you ski. But anyway, please, please don't, don't deny the skiers that opportunity, will you? Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll close the... Uh, general public comment time and run to the non-public hearing items, items 7 through 53, and we will open public comment on those items. I have a two speaker request forms, uh, James uh, McElderry, did I get that right? McElderry. On item number 46 and the three minute time also applies, sir. Well, I'm here to talk about the road that they're trying to plan on out there at Neva Way and going through to uh, 143. Originally, it was planned to go through a field that would be to the west of the housing out there where it would not disturb any of the housing. Right now, the one that they're trying to plan is going to affect seven families and homes right directly where they're planning to go. And it looks to me like they could still the road off of uh, Country Road that's going north, they could still do that. But it just don't seem like that it should be fair to disrupt seven families in their homes. Thank you. Thank you. Now another speaker request from Carl uh, Klutz or Klutz? <coughs> Klutz? On same item, number 46. Thank you. Uh, my issue with uh, this is it affects my property directly. I've been out there for 30 years and I have a septic field and a tree line set up and I want to know how is this going to affect my property because I'm not, my property is not very wide. It's narrow. 
And if they put this in, it's going to take probably a good third of it. And I just need some answers on that. That's all. Okay, thank you, sir. And we will close public comment on uh, items 7 through 42. Um, okay, now on to consent items. Uh, consent items 7 through 42. Does anyone want to remove items from 7 through 42? Wait, Darla Drew? Okay, any further, John Roberts? Item 46. Okay, so can I have a motion to approve the consent calendar with the exception of item 27? So moved. Moved by Lewis. Second. Second by Nordstrom. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. On to item 27. Thank you, Mayor. Item number 27 is to confirm the reappointment of Melbert Sayo and Jamie Alhaj and Lynn uh, Genowin to the Human Relations Commission. I make a motion to approve. Second. Second by Jerry Wright. Any further comment? This is <laughs> Darla Drew. <laughs> All right. Uh, I, I wanted to bring up this item because I... I wanted to talk a little bit about how young energy can make a difference in um, in city council and in the way our city is run. Um, we were going, I am the liaison to the Human Relations Commission and it was, uh, some of the terms were up. And Von Fargus came, um, our new liaison from the, uh, between the American Indian Community and the Rapid City Police Department and spoke about his commitment to the city and how he was so honored to be part of this discussion and to be invited to the Human Relations Commission. He spoke so passionately about his feelings towards Rapid City and making things better between our two communities that the people that were considering leaving actually decided not to. So um, I guess this is a call to action and an encouragement if you feel strongly about something, you can change the minds and hearts of people around you. And that's what Vaughn did that day. And so um, we didn't have to change or, or realign the commission in any way or, or seek new membership, which is always nice for continuity. And so I would like to thank these three individuals for choosing to serve another three years and also to Vaughn for speaking up so passionately and compassionately about the... Um, the service he is going to render in Rapid City, and I yield. Okay, thank you. The motion is to approve. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. This takes us on to the non-consent items, items 43 through 53, and I handled a couple things out of order earlier, but I think it's probably okay. Uh, we'll open public comment on 43 through 53. And we have one speaker request from uh, Robert um, on both 46 and 53. If you could pronounce your name correctly when you introduce yourself, that would be good. Uh, I'm Robert Heidgerken. I'm also a Mead County Commissioner. And I was interested in that extension of the uh, La Crosse Street, um, one of the proposals I've seen went all the way to West Nike Road and almost right to the county line. And I just wanted to, to uh, ask you to stay in touch with us as a commission so that we can do uh, some adjustments to our side of West Nike Road when it comes time that that road be built so that uh, you know, maybe we can uh, work together to get our, our part built up as good as your part will be. And uh, I guess that was one of the main reasons that I came tonight is I, I just wanted to ask that we cooperate on this as much as we can. <coughs> uh, 
on the on the on the one with the fire department, I think it was 43. Uh, I'm also on the North Elk Fire Protection District Board, and we're the ones that collect the taxes for uh, that the finance the North Haines Fire Protect Fire North Haines Fire Department. We contract with them to do our uh, fire protection, and uh, when you guys do annex these properties into the city, you've always paid that portion of the part that was annexed uh, to the fire district uh, so that we could use that to pay off our debt. And I would like to see that continue. I, I, I don't think this is a huge expense when, when these annexations occur, unless you're going to do a, a, you know, a huge annexation. But most of this is just ag land, and, and you know, the value of it is not that high. Those are the two things that would. Thank you for your time. Hey, thank you. And those are all of the speaker request forms. We'll close public comment and that'll take us on to ordinances and we'll go to Amanda Scott for item number 43. Thank you, Mayor. Item number 43 is the second reading of ordinance number 6066. An ordinance to amend provisions for city payment of debt acquired by rural fire protection districts prior to annexation by amending Chapter 3.20 of the Rapid City Code to make a motion to approve. Second by Steve Laurenti. All those in favor of approval say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. Item number 44, first reading ordinance number 6083, an ordinance to revise the name and update the mission of the Rapid City Fire Department by amending Chapter 2.36 of the Rapid City Municipal Code and make a motion to approve. Second by Darla Drew. All those in, forward, uh, in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. Item number 45 is the first reading of Ordinance number 6075, an ordinance to amend provisions concerning special event alcohol beverages, beverage licenses to allow charitable organizations to sell donated alcohol by amending section 5.12.035 of the Rapid City Municipal Code. I make a motion to approve. Second. Uh, second by Steve Laurenti. All in favor of approval say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, item number 46 is a public works committee item, but I believe that the direction was to have staff provide a report. Okay, has staff provided a report? Okay, Brett Limbaugh. Um, Mayor, um, Planning Commission will be looking at the uh, long range transportation plan this Thursday. It's the 2040 transportation plan. That, of course, will come through the committee system and to council for final approval. Um, as the plan states, this is a long range transportation plan. When we look at planning roadways, and in particular arterials, we're looking not at just Rapid City, but we're looking at Pennington County, and Mead, and Somerset, and Blackhawk, and every other uh, entity that's in our metropolitan planning organization. And what we have to do is envision where roadways should be, and that's a general location for the roadway, and a general designation of what that roadway could be. But until such time as a developer would want to develop the land adjacent to that roadway, the roadways usually are not constructed. It would have to take the city to really want to see uh, a particular roadway constructed, and if that were the case, then they'd have to do an engineering study, confirm the alignment, they'd have to do the appropriate uh, condemnations, and, and they would have to pay those landowners for that roadway, and then, of course, they'd have to build it. Uh, it is not in the city's best interest to go out and build a number of roadways that don't have development adjacent to them. Uh, but we do have to show them on the plan so that uh, when I move on and, and the council moves on or the mayors move on and you have these transitions in your decision makers, at least you have something in place that shows you what the intent was. So I would hope that would provide a little bit of comfort to those folks who are in the audience tonight with respect to this planning issue in the five years that I've been here. I've seen a number of our 
future roadway alignments adjusted, eliminated, so on and so forth by councils and planning commissions. So I don't want them to feel that this is a, a line drawn in the sand and will absolutely be constructed in this particular alignment. Um, I hope that answers your question. I'm not sure if that answers the question from those who spoke tonight, um, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. And then uh, Dale Tech can also help with any uh, technical issues with roadway construction. Okay, now we'll go to Amanda Scott. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to make a motion to approve and retain the floor, if I may. Second. Go ahead, second by John Roberts. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have a letter here from a, a, a person who does not live in Ward 4 but lives just north of Ward 4 on Nike Road. And I visited with this um, young lady and uh, Mr. Limbaugh, I, I basically told her the same thing is that this item on the agenda tonight is like a proposal that in the long term the road is going to go in this general area and she was quite concerned to make sure that she didn't lose property and that, that it couldn't just be taken away from her and that they just couldn't you know, build a road overnight and have it out there. I did um, obligate to her that I would read her letter. It's very short, but I do want to read it and put it on the record. Mayor, if I may? You bet. Thank you. Um, per our conversation today on the proposed comprehensive plan amendment for the annexation of La Crosse Street to be located east of our property line, we, the property owners, would like to go on record with our objections to the planned road. We strongly object to the addition of another busy road on the east side of our property as we already have a busy road on the west side of our property. The road was annexed by the city a few years ago and since the time West Nike Road has fallen into disrepair. The road has not been maintained like it should and the patchwork continues to grow with repeated patches getting bigger and deeper. The road is falling apart at the edges. Cracks are all over the road with a lot of dips. The culvert is being patched and has a dip in the road all the way across above the culvert from settling. The road ditches are never mowed except for what the property owners do around their property. The property with the red barns has a retaining pond that always floods the property. Roads are seldom plowed in the wintertime. We feel if West Nike cannot be maintained, then there is no need to build another road that won't be maintained as well. We believe the soil conditions in this area are not suitable for any road built in this area. And then she did attach her um, neighbors, and she said that it was fine with them, but since they didn't sign it themselves, I'm not going to read it into record. Um, and I will give this copy of the letter to Mr. Limbaugh, just so that it is part of the record. Um, and then just to reiterate, <coughs> I did visit with her and I let her, her concern is she's not part of the city and yet in her letter she, she, she's under the impression that West Nike Road is in the city. I believe a portion of it may be in the city but not all of it. So when she's talking about portions of West Nike that are in disrepair, we do have a Meade County Commissioner that was here and is aware of the issues um, on West Nike Road and so I think the citizens just want to make sure that their best interests are going to be taken into consideration when the road as Mr. Limbaugh says, actually is worked on and proposed to go out for bid and all that other stuff. And I did let the young, lo young lady know that there's a lot of work that has to be done before a road is actually physically put into production out there. So I do appreciate all the property owners being very interested in this and please keep your eyes on it. Um, I do believe you'll get plenty of notification when activity actually goes out there. I yield the floor, thank you. Okay, now we'll go to Jerry Wright. Thank you, Mayor. I did ask that this be brought to Council for discussion and, and it was not for discussion in the particular alignment of this road. I just wanted to share, and Brett can help me maybe, how important the major street plan is and how important it is that we as a Council are aware of it and involved with it because that basically prescribes or lays out where we think this community is going to grow over the next 5 to 10 to 50 years. A good example is 5th Street South. That was laid out in the mid-70s. It's so important and it was also the basis that we were established in 1973, I believe it was. By filing the major street plan, we also were able to do jurisdiction planning within a three mile jurisdiction, which gave us the authority and the ability as a community to do long range planning and control, control and guide the development of our community throughout. So it is a very important process and a very important document for all of us to be aware of and be sensitive and, and as informed about as we possibly can. Thank you. Thank you. And now, go to Brad Estes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, uh, I need to uh, abstain from this. I, I, the council needs to know that I am a party to item number 53. 
which is a development in as a, as a part of the stipulation with the city to get our development approved um, our engineering firm was required to submit a realignment proposal for this street um, and I'm comfortable that I've not talked to anybody up here about this you vote as you will but I but I feel that this this impacts uh, item number 53 and so I will be abstaining thank you Okay, we're on item number 46, and there's a motion to approve on the floor. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, say no. Item passes. You want to finish reading those? Yeah, sure. Item number 47. Request from Status of Ellsworth Task Force Mem Memorandum of Understanding uh, near the floor to Al Alderman Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. <laughs> I had some uh, constituents bring some questions and concerns forward about this, and that's why I ran ac across Public Works last week. And I was wondering, Mr. Mayor, if there's a couple of questions I could ask you about this. Yes, you may. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, first, were you the one that turned the funding back on for the Ellsworth Task Force? Yes, I am. Thank you very much. And the other one was, now I lost my train of thought. Can I go to the finance officer for just one minute? Can I ask her a question? Yes, you may. Thank you. Pauline, <laughs> you sent me last, or a couple of weeks ago, the financials for Ellsworth Task Force, and I didn't see any difference between the ones you sent me and the ones that were sent in March. Can you explain to me the difference between the two? I guess I'm not sure what you saw in March. What I gave you was the compilation that was performed by Cato after I requested that to be done. The initial financial statements that I saw were actually budgets and not actual expenditures and revenues. And so I'm not sure what you saw in March, so I'm sorry. Oh, and I can send that to you. Basically, it was the exact same thing that you sent me. And you had some concerns at that time. So can I ask you what changed and why you no longer seem to have those concerns? Because if it's what I'm thinking it was, it was budgeted numbers and not showing um, the actual revenues and expenditures. Okay. I can send it back to you, what I yeah, got. Yeah, please that do, because can. I know that we didn't get this until after I actually met with, with the Ellsworth Task Force um, and then also with Dave Neese that was with the mayor's office. Okay. Thank you, Pauline. Yep. And Mr. Mayor, the last question I had is are you still looking at possibly an MOU with the task force yes I um, after meeting with them in July I made a decision to uh, well after meeting with them and after viewing all of the uh, documentation on file with the task force uh, made a decision to restore the funding and when I did that, I uh, made a suggestion to uh, Jeff Karsrud, who was the uh, new chairman of that committee, uh, to be more transparent in their dealings, uh, both internally and externally, and um, that we would address a task or a uh, MOU in the future, but that it would not be a high priority. And that was less than 90 days ago, and that's where we're at right now. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate that very much. I've noticed the years I've been sitting on this council that usually transparency comes before funding, not funding before transparency. So thank you very much. Amanda Scott. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to acknowledge this, the update on the Ellsworth Task Force Memorandum, Memorandum of Understanding status. Second. Second by Steve Laurenti. Yield the floor. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. Item number 48 is reject the purchasing authority of the one, one end loader, Caterpillar model 966, and authorize staff to advertise for bids for one end loader. Um, I'll yield the floor. Amanda Scott. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to make that motion. To reject the contracts and go out for bid? Correct. Okay, and a second by Darla Drew. I yield the floor. 
Go to Jerry Wright. Just a hope, uh, housekeeping thing, it should read one front end loader, not one end loader. So make sure that was reflected correctly in the minutes. Okay, Chad Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I guess the reason this is on the non-consent calendar is because I voted against it at Public Works because I felt as though we sent this out to bid now twice and we're going to go back for a third time and I just felt at, to the companies that have actually gone to the trouble of submitting these bids and uh, their end of it just doesn't seem fair to them to have to keep, uh, we can't make a decision or we can't come up with a way to do it and we keep coming back here and redoing it. It just doesn't seem, I mean, a lot of these guys are commissioned salesmen. I don't know for sure if they are at all these places, but you know, they've got families, they've got jobs. Um, I think if we screwed up, we should probably just do it this time the way we've done it and uh, accept these bids and then if we, want, we need to fix something going forward to go ahead and do that. But I just felt as uh, someone who's, you know, out in the field and uh, has family support myself, I just thought maybe there's someone on the other end of this that might be uh, suffering or because of our lack of making the ability to make a decision. And uh, like I said, I don't know, there's a lot of different ways to do this, but I just felt that was my stance for voting against it, so I will be voting against the, the motion. Thank you. Okay, now we'll go to Brad Estes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I'm not going to vote for this. I, I, I fully feel that uh, we're well, you know, I supported buying this piece of equipment from the National, whatever, Joint, National Boy, Joint Powers Alliance contract the first time. You know, there's, there's several phases of, of, of buying this equipment. A, number one, the staff and the department heads tried it out, tried out a piece of equipment. They know, they know what they want. They know what fits their needs. Number two, it's legal. It's a legal, fo it's a legal way of purchasing it. And number three, through, through everything we've gone through, we know that this is priced competitively. Uh, it, 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 meets, it meets, in my mind, all the requirements of, of, of being a guardian of the taxpayer's dollars. And, and I just, um, you know, we buy equipment, I, I'm going to say maybe all the time, but we do. We do buy a, a fair amount of equipment on, on pre-established uh, bid lettings that have been set up ahead of time and, and piggyback on them, and, and this is completely legal, and, and I, I support it. Thank you. Okay, Amanda Scott. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, the reason that I'm looking at 48 and 49 and putting it back out for bids is because based on what our Public Works Director, Terry Wolsterstorff, had indicated to the Public Works Committee when this was being discussed, is that the department, which I believe was the landfill, um, went through this. It, they had some new staff, and they did not really put out the best criteria for the bids that they had put out when they were directed by City Council. And I believe the Public Works Director had indicated, or at least it was my perception that he had indicated, that they do need the um, template in order to be able to put out these bids going forward. And so I support the rejection of the purchasing authority and to set it back out to bid um, because I really don't want to push the can down the road to wait to the next time we have to bid and see if they can get it right then. I would just as soon take the time, it's not an emergency, and let them put the bids out correctly this time and let's go ahead and, and, and fulfill the, the bid process for this item since it has been contentious um, with the two different bidding options and uh, that's why I support rejecting it and putting back to Public Works and letting the staff go ahead and put their template together on how to bid equipment out going forward. This will not be the last time that the city has to purchase this type of equipment. Thank you. I yield the floor. Okay, Richie Nordstrom. Thank you, Mayor. I'll be voting against this uh, as well. Um, primary reason is the, the largest equation for me in this whole thing is the time that's going to be put into it. I was listening to the Public Works Committee meeting and saying that, that everything was equal, but I think the biggest thing that's different for me on this is the time that's involved in putting a bid together. Whereas if we just go to the National Joint Powers Agreement, uh, they can, very similar to uh, a picking from a menu their item that, that they need from off of the uh, uh, the list of uh, equip, uh, equipment that's available from the national joint. So um, th for me, that's, that's the biggest equation. All things being equi equal, the time is the biggest difference, and that 
we can have staff doing other things than, than writing up bids. Thank you. Okay, Jerry Wright. I support the rejection of both these items on, and I've made my position made and clear in that I feel that we have adequate competition in our community to provide bids on a competitive basis under state law and sealed bids so we get a good price, we get a good machine. I think we owe them the chance to, to do it. The issue with buying on a national contract and so forth is, is, in my opinion, is we could be short-circuiting the intent and purpose of state law of sealed bids. Because technically, I think if we want to go around, we could buy these without ever bidding if we wanted to, and I don't think that's good business. I think we owe it to our local businesses when they can provide the equipment that we need to give them a chance to compete and bid with us. Thank you. So I'll be voting for the rejection and reauthorization. Thank you. Okay, Steve Laurenti. Thank you, Mayor. And I, I'm afraid to say this, but I agree with Jerry Wright on this particular issue. <laughs> that's just a joke. We agree on probably 99% of everything. That's just the one, you know, the 1% of the big things that come up. But I agree with Jerry. I think we need to reject this bid. I mean, there were mistakes made, but the bottom line is we're going to save money. Whatever that amount is, there is a savings. So it should be given to the taxpayers, ultimately. They're the ones that are paying for this equipment. So we need to, uh, to do that. We need to maximize not only trying to buy it locally, but we need to maximize the savings for the taxpayer, whatever amount that is. I don't know what the final figure will be, but I think it was less um, what we had. Of course, now we're rejecting that and we're going back, but I think we're going to get a, a much better price than the national. And, um, we'll be able to talk about that when they uh, put it back out for RFP and we see what the savings is. But the bottom line is we need to try to get it locally and save as much money as we can for the taxpayer. I yield. Okay, Brad Estes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a question for our city attorney, Joel Lundin, if I could. Go ahead. Uh, just as a point, Joel, is, is buying from this national uh, buying group uh, against state law? Uh, no, we buy off uh, previously bid contracts all the time. Normally, normally we buy off the state contract, but so would it be your opinion that if it, if it was bypassing state law, that it wouldn't be legal? Correct. It, this is perfectly um, in compliance with Thanks. state law. Thanks. I, I thank you. Okay. Seeing no other speaker requests. Um, Motion on the floor is to reject the bid on 48 and uh, advertise for new bids. All those in favor of that motion say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Aye. Roll call, please. Nordstrom. No. Scott. Aye. Lorente. Aye. Wright. Aye. Estes. No. Lewis. Drew? No. Roberts? Aye. It's a tied vote, four to four. Okay, and can the chair vote on this? I'm trying to decide because it, you're authorizing the bid, not the actual expenditure. Well, you know you're authorizing the expenditure of money, so I think you need a majority so it would fail of the council members. Okay, motion. Fail. The motion fails. Yeah. Correct. There are not sufficient votes for it to pass. Okay, go to Chad Lewis. I'd like to make a motion to authorize to accept these bid this bid. Second, Second by Brad Estes. <laughs> Okay, all those in favor of approving this. Uh, so unless somebody changes their vote, you're stuck. Could continue it. Or I'd say have the vote, see if anybody switches, and if they don't, then look at an alternative way to resolve it. Okay, so the first motion that failed was to was to approve the rejection. Oh. 
Well, this is what, hold on. I guess we're not, since you weren't, the, uh, the request initially was that you purchase off the contract. So you were rejecting purchasing off the contract. There obviously isn't enough boats to purchase off the contract. So to direct staff, you would not need six votes in order to direct staff to prepare bid documents and bid it instead of purchase off the contract. You do not have sufficient votes to purchase it off the contract because that would actually be authorizing staff to expend the money. Okay, so there's the mayor a mayor could break a tie since it is to reject now that we've worked through it, yes, you could vote to break the tie if you chose to break the tie. Because if he breaks the tie supporting the, it's not spending money, it's directing staff essentially to go back and write bids so you're not expending money. Anybody else confused? He could, he could rescind his motion or you could vote on the motion and when it fails, go back to a motion to direct staff to prepare. Okay, we have a motion on the floor now to approve the bids and purchase this item, correct? correct. And do we have a second? Did we have a second? Yes, as does. Okay, so let's vote on this, but it would be my recommendation to, to postpone this thing to the next public works uh, rather than try to go through this. Uh, vote no means I'll yes. I'll withdraw my motion in that case and, and substitute my motion. Okay, change my motion to send it to public works. Or no? I'll just withdraw my, withdraw my motion then. Amanda Scott. I'd like to make a substitute motion to send this back to public works at next week's meeting for consideration and a recommendation. Second by Steve Laurenti. Jerry Wright, you want to talk? Okay, you have uh, four minutes and 10 seconds left. I don't think tonight we can authorize the contract purchase because it isn't part of the agenda. Maybe going out on a limb there. But I think council, but making the decision of sending it back for them to re-advertise, excuse me, to give them an authorization to re-advertise and seek to purchase through sealed bids. We're making progress, we're going forward, and we're staying within everything that's legal, and we can get the equipment on the way. If we move it back to Public Works, there may be no movement. Thank you. Steve Laurenti. Thank you, Mayor. If I can, I'd like to, and if Alderwoman would oblige, I just want to ask uh, Alderwoman Scott a question on her motion. Of course, I seconded it, so. I um, just want to be clear with her about my second and where she's wanting to go with it. But my question, if I can, Mayor. Go ahead. Alderwoman Scott, on, on this particular, the reason I seconded it is because I was hoping that, you know, one, we, we would keep this, uh, we need to re-add, authorize the bid, in my opinion. We need to get it back out there and get these things purchased because they're needed. So my question to you on your motion is, what is, what do you hope to see happen with the motion? The reason I made the motion and, and uh, was being egged on by Alderman Lewis down there at the end, but um, the reason I made the motion is to send it back to Public Works, and hopefully when it goes through Public Works with a recommendation back to the full council, we will have full council, 10 members here, to be able to take a vote on this, because I do believe if the other two members were here, we would be able to move this forward. But we are missing two council members tonight. All right, thank you. Charlene. Can I ask a clarification? Are we sending the reject purchase, or we're sending the item that's on the floor now, reject purchasing authority? We're sending that whole thing back. Okay, thanks. Is this 48? Or no? Open twice. Okay, the motion on the floor is to send this item back to Public Works next week, is that correct? And there is a second. So all in favor of that motion say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Here. Oh my goodness. 
Go ahead, Charlie. Scott. Lorente. Aye. Wright. Aye. Estes. No. Lewis. No. Drew. No. Roberts. Nordstrom. No. It's a three four vote. Okay. Yes, failed three to four. Mayor, may I speak? I think I could put some light on this, if I might. I already spoke twice on this issue. Amanda. S All messed up. Spoken twice on this issue? Okay. Anyone have a new motion? Joel? Are you willing to break the tie to direct staff to prepare written bid documents? That seems peculiar that I would be allowed to vote to break a tie if I was going to vote one way but not the other. It is peculiar, but you cannot expend money unless the majority of the council approves it. We don't have the votes to have the majority of the council approve purchasing, the, purchasing these pieces of equipment off the contract. Because directing staff to prepare bid documents is not an expenditure of money, you can legally break the tie on that because it does not require a majority of council members to vote on it. It just requires a vote of the aldermen present. Well, there's currently no motion on the floor at this point. Does someone have a motion? Amanda Scott. Thank you, Mayor. On item number 48, I would like to make the motion to request the mayor to authorize staff to advertise bids for one front end loader. Second. I yield the floor. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, folks. This is uh, this is really something. Uh, can we not? Uh, that's not an item that was on this agenda. Am I correct? Well, I mean, I think that was the discussion at Public Works that if they were going to reject, if you don't approve uh, purchasing it off the contract, then Mr. Waltersdorf said that the alternative would be to go back and, and prepare bids. I understand that, but the, what's, what's on the agenda is to reject the purchasing authority and authorized staff to re to advertise for bids. We voted on that, and it's a tie. So well, the recommendation, the item was to purchase it. So I mean, frankly, if you want to move on, the 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 item requested failed. I mean, the request from the staff was that they purchase off the state contract. There are not sufficient votes to purchase it off. Not excuse me, not off the state, but the national joint powers contract. There are not sufficient votes to do that, so the the request of staff fails. And what we're struggling with now is traditionally when you have an item, there's an up or down vote on the item, but this one is just going to fail by operation of law. So quite frankly, you can move on, and I guess the reality is at that point, if Public Works wants to purchase this equipment, they're going to have to write bid specs, which is what Mr. Waltersdorf already acknowledged. So perhaps the proper course of action is to just move on because it failed. But what failed was to reject the motion well, to but reject the... That, but it, just because it was put that way on the agenda, the request from staff was to purchase the items off the, the original request that was in front of the committee was to purchase the items off the National Joint Powers Alliance contract. The recommendation of the committee is that that we reject that and they wanted to see bids written. So even though it's written that way on the agenda, the request was to purchase the items off that contract. There are not sufficient votes to authorize that 
that request. Okay, and I don't believe I'm going to break the tie, but here there are implications to this type of item on this agenda. And that is that this particular bid um, is only one form of statewide or national bid. So staff, meanwhile, is waiting around in the workplace wondering if they should buy a vehicle off of the state vehicle bid or if they should uh, scrap all ready-made bids. And it's also confusing because on this particular bid, the I believe the purchase, isn't the purchase of this item from a local vendor? Yes. So the purchase is from a local vendor, but we wanted to reject this so that we could get bids from a local vendor. And the local vendors already competed, and all the local vendors who supply this product have the ability to compete for this national bid. So the, the, I'm just saying the, the issue is very confusing to staff. And... Um, I got a f feeling what's going to happen tomorrow is Public Works is going to start preparing bids to be sent out so they can get rid of this issue and buy themselves a piece of equipment. But we just need to get this thing through the agenda. So we took a 4-4 vote. It died. Can we move on to item number 49? Can't move on, we're stuck. I, I, no, I think honestly you can move on. At this point, you've got a 4 4 vote. And if you don't want to break the tie, I mean, the item has failed, which was the original staff request that they purchased off the contract. So I don't think they need to be directed. At this point, public work staff, honestly, they can write, they'll, if they need this equipment, they can write specs or they can just decide they don't need the equipment. I mean, my guess is you're correct. They will write, start writing the bid specs. Mayor, I rescind my motion. What good will that do? <laughs> okay, let's, all right, let's just move on. Jerry, do you need to say one more thing? I'd like to clarify. I think that on the national contracts, whatever they are, they're determined by bids that have occurred at other places. It does not necessarily that the local bidders or local suppliers ever bid on them. They may supply the machinery because the manufacturer has an agreement with that dealer that they will make the sale of all new equipment in their area, but they are not necessarily and probably are not bidding on those national contracts. These national contracts could be involved with Forest Service, it could be Department of Defense, it could be a DOT and so forth. So just to clarify, the local dealer may would probably make the sale and delivery but would not be bidding on it. Thank you. John Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can I ask a question of the city attorney? Yes. Joel, um, can the mayor just decide what he wants to and doesn't want to vote on in case of a tie? I don't believe the mayor is legally required. He is available. He can break a tie. He does not have to. Thank you. I mean, at this point, whether he breaks the tie or not, the result is essentially the same. Because he can't break the, there's only one way he can break the tie. Thank you. Go on to Brad Estes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It is all, uh, they, they first came to us with a, national, a request to purchase on a national contract, and then we went up for bid, and that bid showed that, the, um, that the, actually the price went up and uh, the, the cat and the other piece of equipment were within $300. So it comes, is what I'm saying is, is the national bid was the, 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 le the most competitive price that we've seen. Um, I know Dale doesn't have it, but that's why I'm saying it's legal, it's competitive for price, I don't care where it was bid at. We piggyback on national golf equipment. It doesn't matter. It's, it's a legal, it, there was a bid letting somewhere that legally set the prices. Um, it is, it's competitive, it's a piece of equipment they want, and uh, it, it was legally bid. And I, I think we should just buy the darn thing tonight. Okay, let's go on to item 49. Yeah. Yeah. 
49 is reject purchasing authority for two skid loaders, John Deere model 326E, and authorize staff to advertise for bids for two skid loaders. Wright and Laurenti. Oh, let's go to a roll. Let's go to roll call. Laurenti. Wright. Aye. Estes. No. Lewis. No. Drew. No. Roberts. Aye. Nordstrom. No. Scott. It's a 4-4 vote. No, again, there aren't sufficient votes. I would recommend just moving on to the next item. Item 50. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Item number 50 is acknowledge report and discussion the cross country skiing and other winter rec rec recreational activities at Medwick Golf Course. I move to acknowledge. Second. Second by John Roberts. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. Item number 51 is to approve change order number 2F. For Simon Contractors of South Dakota, Inc., for payment rehabilitation project and for a decrease of $1,953.97. I move to approve the amended change order. Second. Second by John Roberts. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. Amanda. Thank you, Mayor. Item number 52 is to acknowledge the update on President's Plaza project and to authorize staff to work with the President's Plaza group to separate the public and the private portions of the project. I make a motion to approve. Second, Second by uh, Chad Lewis. And we'll go to Steve Laurenti. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, I'll be voting against this, but obviously it has the votes uh, based on the legal and finance as well. But I just want to air some concerns that I have as the talks begin with these developers that, well, one, it seems to me a misnomer to say that we're going to separate them, public and private, and at the same time say we're, we're going to use a TIF to help pay for the parking lot. That's not possible because the city is not a tax-paying entity. So to say that the financing is separate and that we're going to use a TIF to pay for the parking, which the city is supposed to be financing alone, that's not possible. So I just want to make sure that we're above the board and being very transparent because <clears throat> I don't think the taxpayers are aware of the fact that the city can have a TIF for itself to pay for parking. So that TIF is, a pri is for private development. And so already there's bad information out there to the public. And so I don't know who is responsible for that, but I just want to make sure that the public is aware that if a TIF is being used to pay for the parking lot that is supposed to be built alongside this private development, then the financing will not be separate. It will not. It's impossible. So I just want to clarify that, <clears throat> and, and we need to make sure that we're communicating this at the all levels possible because we're talking about millions of dollars. Um, especially where the TIF is concerned. Maybe it will be less, but I'm going to be looking at the financing in extreme detail, but I just want to make sure that the public understands already that there's some misleading facts out there, and we need to be careful about it as we move forward. Thank you, Mayor. Chad Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and speaking of misleading information, this is the reason this is going to be separated out is because the public and the public and the private finance can be completely separate. The TIF is going to be created by, it's going to be paid for by the building that's being built. So that's going to finance the TIF. So the structure that's being built will create, generate the re revenue for the tax, the extra increment, and that's going to pay for the parking garage. So the private financing will actually be financing the public part of the project. And so that is where the, that's where it's, this way it's completely transparent. Everybody can see exactly what's going on. We're going to, we're not going to, they're going to construct a, whatever building they're going to build there. And that building's going to be taxed at a certain rate, and the money from that tax 
is going to pay for the parking structure and they're going to get back the $2 million or whatever it is for the financing for the vision fund and we're going to go on our merry way and hopefully we'll get something done finally downtown after all these years and that's the, the intent behind this whole project and the way to do it this way. So, um, and I welcome anybody to go ahead and look right at the financing so it's going to be right there. You can look right at it and you can see exactly what's going on it's, and there's, the, the, the TIF is that block. It's nothing else. There's nothing else included in that TIF to my knowledge unless I'm missing misinformed here so anyway that's what's going on so it once again it's gonna be completely separate they're gonna build their building we're gonna build a public garage that's going to be largely financed by the revenue from that building's taxes Richie Nordstrom thank you mayor and uh, I may have to have uh, finance corroborate this for me but I just did a quick look on the research for the tax increment financing for the city of Rapid City, and I'm seeing two on here. One has a project plan, and those were back in February 5th, 1990. Uh, and there's a second one here as well. And I was looking, I thought there was a third one, but I'm not seeing it. I may be skimming over it. But yeah, there is a precedent for the city of Rapid City to be involved in TIFs. Thank you. Thank you, John Roberts. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Nordstrom, myself, and Jerry Wright sat on the President's Plaza Committee for, I think, the last three years until the new one took effect here a few months ago. Um, this proposal was actually brought forward about a year ago to former Mayor Sam Quaker. Um, unfortunately, with the Civic Center and a bunch of other things that were going on, he did not bring it to this council. I agree that this is the best option possible for the city of Rapid City. By splitting the building from the parking structure, letting the taxes off that building and the TIF pay for the parking structure, the city is getting a parking structure that we've needed downtown for, well, that lot's been empty, I think, since I've been, since I was about seven years old. And we need something on there. We're going to have housing. We're going to have commercial. We're going to have uh, we're going to we're going to have something finally on that lot, including the much needed parking for downtown. And by splitting this, the developers are going to get back two million dollars of vision funds. They are going to be purchasing their piece of property on that lot from from the city. There's, that's going to be coming forward. Uh, and all of their taxes will be frozen to pay that TIF for that parking structure that you, as the citizens, otherwise would have to pay for. So we're using a piece of property that isn't there, <laughs> that may not ever be there if we don't go forward with some plan, to pay for something that's much needed downtown. So anyway, I do want to thank the mayor for taking this by the horns and bringing it forward. I think it's something that's going to be absolutely wonderful for downtown Rapid City, and I think it's something that's going to help Rapid City get put back on the map. I mean, once you start growing up downtown, your city starts growing out. So I just want to thank everybody that's been involved in this. Brad Estes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'm going to repeat a lot of things that have been said, but you know, I think as council people, we've been charged with one thing, and that's that's to get a project built on that corner. And I think the taxpayers and, and the voters and everybody has made it clear that that under the present agreement, uh, there's absolutely no comfort level in in being able to having the ability to explain exactly where the the taxpayers' dollars start and where the private developers. Uh, investment ends and and this is this is the uh, well it may not be perfect it is the uh, most transparent way to, sh to to show the citizens exactly how we're gonna finance the parking ramp which has to be figured out yet but but at least that parking ramp will stand on its own it'll be on city property and we'll have to hash out how it gets financed and and it won't get built unless until we agree on the financing mechanism for it and likewise then um, the piece of property the 
the west 100, 120 feet of that block, then we'll get platted off and, and, and then the developer's financing will have to stand on its own. And, uh, and I don't think I don't think we want we don't want a parking ramp without a building there, and they're not going to build a building there without a parking ramp. So so there's still a lot of things to be worked out. But to, but this is the first step to, in my mind, get something that where we can actually um, sit down and and sh and show the taxpayers exactly uh, in, with numbers that they can be followed. Thank you, Darla Drew. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just because I, I kind of came in to the council um, midstream here when when this was kind of already started, a question for Joel Landine, if I may. Yes, you may. Okay. Um, we have a contract with Dream, Dream Design to to start this project by when? I believe the deadlines are that they be under contract with a or. A, have a contract with someone to construct it by the end of this year and be under construction by uh, June sometime of next year. Uh, so this is about our best option at this point. I mean, we're kind of down to the deadline here, correct? Yes. I mean, we are at the end of, heading towards the end of our agreements with them. Okay. Um, I, I also agree and support this project. I think it's it will be a, um, really good for uh, generating tax and revenue for the city so in instead of a parking lot which is being used it's not just an empty lot um, but this will be a much better use of the space and uh, will actually generate some some tax and some revenue for our, our city so I can support this okay thank you all those in favor of uh, approval signify by saying aye, aye. Uh, opposed say no. no one no by mr. Laurenti and let's move on to the item number 53, which is uh, Community Planning and Development Services Department items. Uh, hmm? Yeah, go ahead. Item number 53 is a request by Spurley Consulting for Freeland Meadows, Inc. for a preliminary subdivision plan for proposed lots 20 through 20, 33 of Block 1, lots 3 through, of, through 23 of Block 3, and lots 14 of 26 of Block 4 for Prairie Meadow subdivision, legally described as a portion of government lot 4, section B, Township 2 North. I, I can't read the rest of this. My eyes are bad. <laughs> intersection generally located at County Road and West Nike Road. Thank you. Uh, make a motion to approve the stipulations. Second. Second by Darla Drew. Uh, all in favor of approval say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. And passes with one abstention from Brad uh, Estes. Now on to public hearing items, items 54 through 61. We'll open the public hearing and public comment on those items. And we have a uh, handful of speaker request forms. The first one from Shannon Schaefer's on item number 60. Thank you for this opportunity. I've been a resident of Hall Street for 23 years. Hall Street is a um, residential area with young families and those of us that have been there for a while. This is a residential area where there are eight feet between homes. It is not an area for a bed and breakfast. Bed and breakfasts are traditionally in areas that are more outlying with space um, around them. In our residential area, with our eight feet between homes, there is limited parking. And one of the stipulations for this bed and breakfast was to have, to provide four off-street parking spaces. And the four off-street parking spaces are their driveway and their garage. I don't understand how um, you can run a business and use your own um, private parking as part of that off-street parking. Another concern is that there is a fire hydrant right um, straight out from the home of the bed and breakfast, which is a safety issue and is 
blocked frequently. One last concern as a resident of Hall Street is the safety uh, bed and breakfast coming into a residential area. I don't believe is a, um, it is an added um, safety concern. That's not necessary. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have another request from Dee Dee Engel. And you have three minutes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dee Dee Engel. I live at 3410 Hall Street. I live right next door to Donna, the applicant is, that has applied for the bed and breakfast. Um, I've had a lot of concerns, a lot of ans or questions that haven't gotten answered as to regarding this um, approval of the bed and breakfast. I've lived in the neighborhood for 25 years and now I don't feel safe with different strangers coming and going on a nightly basis. I have had two occasions where guests staying at the bed and breakfast um, have come to my door. One time a, a member or a guest for the bed and breakfast came knocking at my door and asked if this was the bed and breakfast and I said no it's next door. Another occasion um, a cu couple of ladies from Massachusetts pulled up and parked in front of my house. They both went and checked in to the bed and breakfast. I was sitting on my couch. This was at about 6.30, 7 o'clock at night. Um, one of the gals went back to the car to get something out of her car. She literally came walking to my house, opened my front door, and walked in and said, oops, I'm in the wrong house. So in those respects, I don't feel safe. I've lived there for 25 years. Now I feel like I have to live behind a locked door. I can't be out in my backyard or something working in my yard, and I don't know if some stranger is going to walk in, in my front door. Um, this neighborhood has very small lots. I'm eight foot from her driveway. It's just such a close area. Um, to me, a bed and breakfast should be out in a more re remote area or someplace with bigger lots. Another question is the parking, like Shannon brought up. There is a fire hydrant right in front of the house. And I do have pictures. We were, did submit pictures to the Planning Commission of cars continuously being parked in front of the house. My question, and I can't get answers, is who's going to enforce this? When there's cars parked in front of the fire hydrant on a nightly basis, who's going to enforce this? Um, I don't, this, the, Donna is a, a wonderful neighbor. She moved into the neighborhood. She fits right in. I've helped her um, in a lot of different ways. I've helped her move furniture. This has nothing to do with her. It's, it has to do with the nightly guests that are staying there and the strangers in the neighborhood not having, feeling safe and not having parking. So I would really like you to consider um, denying this application. Thank you. Thank you. And now Jeff from 3400 Hall. Please introduce yourself and you have three minutes, sir. Hi there, I'm Jeff Huskin. Thank you for your time. Um, you know, I didn't really know what an Airbnb was until she moved in. I don't really have a problem with it. It's a way of making money. But at the same time, there is a lot of these places in town. Is there any rules for these places? I mean, do you, is there any rules on the books that can, that say what can and can't happen? I, I just, you know, don't know what's going to happen to my property taxes, the value of my home. You know, if, if there's no rules, what's to say that, you know, 10 more of these don't come into my neighborhood and all of a sudden I can't sell my house because it, it, it's a bed and breakfast area, you know? I mean, is there any rules? I, I can't find any. You know, I, I don't have a problem with the bed and breakfast. I'm just, you know, want to know what's going to happen to my property and, you know, what it's worth and in my down the road, am I going to ever be able to sell it, you know, if, you know, the area becomes a bed and breakfast area? Uh, other than that, it's not that big of a deal, you know, a bed and breakfast. It, it's a business. It's not like nothing else. But, you know, 
we need some rules probably to regulate what can and can't happen with this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and now we have uh, Donna Gilbert on item number 60. Good evening. Is this on? Will this show up? Oh. We need some help with the is AV it, is here. Is the power button? Or? Oh. Wait, maybe. My name is Donna Gilbert and I purchased a home on Hall Street in February 2015. The Planning Commission has approved my request for a conditional use permit for an internet bed and breakfast. The company I'm affiliated with is called Airbnb, which people seek short-term lodging. I have met and I have complied with all the city guidelines for a and b I'd like to address the appeal letter submitted by Dee Dee Engel and focus on all her concerns. Didi states, quote, when looking at the Airbnb website for a b and in the Rapid City area, all are in remote areas or large lots. None are in neighborhoods such as the one on Hall Street. Not true. Here's just one example of a West Boulevard area on St. Cloud Street. There's houses closer than mine and Didi's. And that shows right here, this one here, and here's a listing of the Airbnb that I printed offline. This is a brand new home, and this is a home right next door. And I don't, if I can make that clearer or brighter. Um, Didi also stated that, quote, she reviewed city minutes and can't find where the committee has approved a conditional use permit for a b and within city limits, end quote. There, are act, there is an active B&B located in city limits called Amy St. Jean, located at 624 Adams Street, just north of the Civic Center. I spoke with the owner. She has a conventional, conditional use permit. The Planning Commission just approved a B&B about a month ago in the Forest Division off Catron Boulevard. Remote areas is not one of the requirements listed in the city ordinance for a B&B. Also recently, the Canyon Lake Chop House, located in the Chapel Valley residential area, has converted to a reunion cabin and is going to be more temporary occupancy, short-term rentals, as I read an article in the Rapid City Journal. They were approved for a different type of permit, but the rental usage is on the same level as an Airbnb as renting short-term. Didi has also stated that parking continues, quote, Parking continues to be a big concern and that four off-street parking spaces is not practical in this type of neighborhood within Rapid City, end quote. Once again, I have met the city guidelines outlined in the b, &B ordinance. So if DD sees this as a problem, then she needs to address the concern with the city. A positive advantage is that my daughter is a stay-at-home stay mom and is always accessible to move vehicles and attend to immediate needs of the guests. The appeal letter also states, this is, quote, this used, used to be a very safe and quiet neighborhood, but not since the, being, the bed and breakfast started in May, end quote. Where are the noise complaints? And where, and how are the safety concerns validated? These are all opinions and conjecture. There is not one police report nothing addressing my home of any problems with any guest in my home. I appreciate your time and giving me the opportunity to respond to this appeal for an internet-based B&B. Please recognize that multiple complaints don't always mean valid justifications. I ask the City Council for your careful consideration regarding this matter and concur with the appro approval made by the Planning Commission on my behalf. The decision you make today will start a precedence in the Airbnb usage right here in Rapid City. This is what is in city limits for Airbnb users. This is just in city limits. Thank you, Donna. 
Okay, now on item number 61, uh, Sherry. Dieterle? Okay, you have, you have three minutes, ma'am. I would also like to use the projector if I could. Um, my name is Sherry Dieterle. I reside at 3754 Padre Drive. I am the property that is adjacent to 3744 that's uh, requesting the side yard setback from 8 feet to 5 feet. Um, since uh, beginning of June, we've been um, through this with the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, I'm just going to show a few photos that I've taken over time. Sorry, that's upside down. Um, these are the first photos that were taken showing water draining down into our property through the side walls here. Um, that was the first photos taken. Um, they requested Mr. Zanstra to correct that issue and then after that we still continued getting water in our basement and as you can see water also sitting within the two properties. Um, and then also, you know, the first photos were taken June 2nd. Those ones were July 16th. These ones were um, July 20th. A um, little bit harder to see the water that is sitting in between the two properties. Um, and again, the showing of the distance between um, my home and the adjacent property and then the property on the other side. This is a home that's being built currently, showing how dry the ground is at that point. And then these were the last photos that were taken showing um, how wet my crawl space is underneath our home. Um, this situation began in June. Um, Mr. Zanstra and his engineer have attempted to correct the drainage problem three times now to no avail. And then the space between the two properties is still saturated and our crawl space is still saturated as well. We had a professional home inspector come and inform us that the water is um, being trapped between the two properties within a valley. And since there's a utility box straight out from the two properties, the water cannot drain out properly between there. Um, we feel that um, with this water sitting underneath our foundation and underneath our home. Um, he also stated we will be incurring foundation damage and mold issues within our home. Um, I will be also unable to sell my home with water sitting in our crawl space like this and also around the property. If you were to walk around the property, you would realize that it's completely saturated and wet. Um, we feel that the mistake of placing the home in the incorrect location is not our mistake and it was and it's not our error and we should not have to suffer because of it financially or health wise thank you thank you now uh, uh kale kaylee kale yeah thank you mr mayor uh, my name is Cale McNibbo. I'm with Spurlick Consulting. I represent the petitioner, Chad Zanster Construction. Uh, Chad is the individual who built the house at uh, 3744 Padre Drive, right next to the Dieter Lees. Uh, to give you a little bit of background on the project, um, yeah, Chad ended up building the house, and it is approximately two and a half feet into the side yard setback. Um, that was discovered when they had uh, the mortgage survey done. Now, when you have a house that's built into the side yard setback, it's a two part process. You go through and you vacate the utility and minor drainage easement. That did go through the city council and it was approved. Then the other part of that, because we're in a planned development, we go through an exception to the side yard setback from the eight to the five feet. That's where this uh, item, and that's why this item essentially appears before you. Now when we brought this application forward, it went to planning commission. Prior to the first planning commission, um, staff had given me a call and asked me to join them with the Dieterlees, uh, the public works, the planning staff, myself, the Dieterlees and Chad Zanstra, 
to look at the area between the two houses, because really we're talking about that, that strip between the two houses, which normally would be at a minimum 16 feet, and in this case would be reduced to 13 feet between the two houses. What we concluded at that meeting with the public works and the planning staff was that we needed to reshape this channel that exists between the two houses. Reform it to try to move some of the groundwater, or the surface water, excuse me, out from between the houses. We also concluded that their rear yard needed two inlets installed and some storm sewer pipe routed out to the street and discharged the curb line. Subsequent to that initial meeting, this item was continued at Planning Commission several times. My client, what he did was he regraded the area between the houses that we agreed upon at that meeting with the staff. He installed the storm sewer and the inlets into their backyard to take that surface water and try to get it captured, piped off the site. Additionally, since he constructed that house at 3744 Padre Drive, he took the downspouts, rotated them so they discharge straight out the back and out the front so that water doesn't enter this easement that we're talking about between the houses. He also repiped the sump pump discharge from that house to get it to discharge out in front of the house. So there was a number of items that were discussed when we met with the public works and planning staff. We all got together on the site. My clients done those things. And really, um, the question ultimately becomes, is this easement wide enough to convey the stormwater, surface water, between the two houses? And the answer to that question is yes. And with that, um, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions you have. That's all. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. And that is all of our speaker request forms. So we will close public comment. Now on to consent public hearing items 54 through 57. Does anyone want to pull any of those items? If not, can we have a motion? Uh, Move to approve by Lewis, second by Roberts. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Those items carry, 54 through 57 are approved. Now on to the non-consent public hearing items. Uh, Amanda? Thank you, Mayor. Item number 58 is a second reading of Ordinance 6076. An ordinance amending section 17.06 of chapter 17 of the Rapid City Municipal Code, rezoning the within described property as requested by Fisk Land Surveying and Consulting Engineers, Inc. for PLM Development, LLC. It's for a rezoning from public district to low district, or sorry, low density residential one district for property generally described as being located southwest of intersection of Minnesota Street and Fifth Street. I make a motion to approve. Second by Laurenti. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. Item number 59 is a second reading of an ordinance number 6080, an ordinance amending section 17.06 of chapter 17 of the Rapid City Municipal Code. It's a rezoning within the described property as requested by the City of Rapid City for rezoning from a no-use district to a general commercial district for property generally described as located southeast quadrant of Catron Boulevard and Fifth Street. I make a motion to approve with stipulations. Second by Brad Estes. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. Item number 60 is an appeal of the Planning Commission's decision on a request by Donna Gilbert for a conditional use permit to allow a bed and breakfast for property located at 3414 Hall Street. I make a motion to deny Donna Gilbert's conditional use permit to allow a bed and breakfast. If I can get a second, I'd like to retain the floor. Second by Steve Laurenti. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm also the council liaison to the Planning Commission, so I was there while this was being considered by the Planning Commission. Um, what Ms. Gilbert had applied for was a conditional use permit for a bed and breakfast. And as she has showed, she also showed at the Planning Commission, and that is there are very many or a lot of these listings on the Airbnb. 
And the reason, the only reason that I am denying Ms. Gilbert or making the motion to deny this at this time is because she has been operating this and so her plan for the B&B, &B, and to answer the gentleman's question about are there rules, there are rules in order to apply for a special use permit um, or a conditional use permit. And one of the rules is you have to be able to submit your business plan and you have to submit your parking plan. And the parking plan at the Planning Commission was outlined that she had four parking spots, two in the garage and two within her driveway. And yet the neighbors have come forth and they've have freely admitted, and at the Planning Commission, Ms. Gilbert also admitted that it was not only the guest but also her daughter that were parking on the street, and unfortunately, her daughter was probably the one parking in front of the hydrant. So to me, the reason I'm, I'm recommending not to uh, 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 allow the conditional use at this time is I believe Ms. Gilbert, Gilbert needs to work on her plan or her parking plan because it's obviously not working. Her, she needs to readdress the parking plan and be able to have it so that she is not impacting the street because that's what her conditional use permit calls for. So that's the reason I'm making the appeal. I yield the floor. Okay, Darla Drew. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would also um, echo uh, Alderman Scott's uh, opinion. I think that the thing that bothers me the most is the blocking of the fire hydrant. And uh, that is really a safety concern for me. So I would guess if, um, you know, the conditional use can be proved that somehow the parking will be followed as, you know, in their business plan, then maybe we can look at this again. But right now, until the parking is resolved, I can't support this. Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, may I ask a question of our planning director? Yes, you may. Brett, um, looking at this, I have some issues with the parking too. I was curious, have we ever recommended four off-street parking spots with two being in a garage? You know, in this instance, that's what the occupancy is that they're setting. So generally, if you're doing a single family home, and it's just your personal residence, then yeah, your off street parking requirements too. But if you're doing a business that requires additional parking, that's what kicks in this additional requirement. So that's in the code that, okay. That's what I was curious about. I sat through this too on Planning Commission and found it very interesting. And I think that we're gonna have to really look at all of these Airbnbs in Rapid City and at the very least, bring the people that have them into compliance with our codes. So I hope you look into that, Brett. Thank you. Back to Amanda Scott. Thank you, Mayor. I would just like to uh, make a comment on behalf of the air bed and beds and in and, and response to Alderman Roberts's um, concern for these other stack that Ms. Gilbert showed us. And I did inquire as to um, if the city becomes aware that all of these are out there and obviously they uh, most of them if they're in residential areas require a conditional use permit does the city start investigating that and currently the way the city's uh, practices and procedures are is that a formal complaint needs to be filed that is unfortunately how miss gilbert came into this and she admitted that at planning commission too is that um you know the code enforcement came by that's what started it that's when she was notified that she needed a conditional use permit so um, i believe miss gilbert was um, informed at the planning Commission meeting itself that she can actually turn over all of the rest of the listings that she has and that would start the procedure on the rest of them so just wanted to offer that up for clarification thank you thank you so the motion on the floor is to deny the conditional use permit Steve Laurenti thank you mr. mayor and the reason I supported this motion is not only because of the fact that and I know this Airbnb thing is is popular and there's I've read a lot of positive and negatives but where it's affecting neighborhoods, much like the push for chickens in residential areas. I hate to bring that up. Hope nobody's reading that I'm supporting it or something, but the fact of the matter is it affects your neighbors. The part that appalls me the most is that we've come to a point, and I think we all saw a little bit of it tonight, where some people just don't care about what their neighbors think anymore, which is amazing to me. It's sad that we've come to this point. Um, it's like a total disregard for the fact that your potential idea might affect other people. 
especially in your neighborhood and where you live. I mean, these are uh, your neighbors. It's sad that we would see that type of attitude, um, and it's disappointing. But for me, the reason I'm supporting this is that, number one. But number two, we're talking about a conditional use permit for a business being operated out of a residential home. Um, what about the requirements for, we're talking about a business, so are they paying sales tax? I mean, what about the requirements for that, and where does the city play a role in that? If it is a business, are they paying the necessary sales tax if it, because it's a business? So there's a lot of questions, and I think uh, ultimately it's going to take staff um, to take a look at this. And granted, it's something new, but government needs to move with uh, the market. And uh, we do have rules because it is a conditional use permit. Um, and we need to look at this because if it gets too big, let's not wait for it to be a gargantuous problem. Let's be a little more uh, proactive. Granted, we're already in a reactive phase. Let's try to uh, get moving on this. Granted, it's staff time, but I think it would be well worth it. I don't think this will be the last time that this council or future councils will be dealing with this very specific issue. I yield. Darla Drew. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> I have one one question, and I, I saw the stack of papers that you had there. Um, could you please approach the uh, podium, please? Uh, do you know how many um, bed and breakfast that represents? How many in in city limits? There's a stack there. Um. When you go on Airbnb and you type in Rapid City, um, it brings up 86, right now, today, it brings up 86 active Airbnb users in the Rapid City area. Those that I printed right there are the ones that are actually in Rapid City city limits. And they're active and I, year round? I could count them for you. Oh, that's but fine, I, 86 I, is good. So, and they're active year round? Yes. Yeah, okay. some of those are, uh, uh, some of them are rally renters that they're, they're looking to rent their rally home and it'll state that in their heading. But yet if you look, go into their site and look, they are actually renting at other times as well. That's where I, I have a concern here because so many people um, rent out their home for, you know, during the rally and essentially making themselves a, a bed and breakfast for a week to 10 days. So I think we have some research and some homework to do on this particular item because it is so uh, prevalent in our area, especially during August. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, the motion on the floor is to deny the conditional use permit. Uh, all those in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Uh, opposed say no. Okay, that motion passes so the conditional use permit is denied. Item number 61, Mayor, is the appeal of the Planning Commission's decision on a request by Spurlick Consulting, Inc. for Chad Zanstra Construction, LLC, for a major amendment to reduce the side yard setback from 8 feet to 5 feet for an existing one-story structure for property located at 3744 Padre Drive. I make a motion to approve with stipulations, and I'd like to retain the floor if I can get a second. Second by Darla Drew, and go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this item be came before the Planning Commission, and again, I was a liaison on the Planning Commission and currently still am. This item came before the Planning Commission for several meetings um, because as uh, the consultant uh, representing Zantra here tonight indicated, um, Public Works and planning staff members from the city went out and worked with the property owner and um, Zantra's construction and they were really looking at to make sure that the water that was contributing to the crawl space on the adjacent property was not being attributed to the storm water. And so not saying that to start with it could have been contributed, no one knows, but the corrections that kept this item before the planning commission was to ensure that the storm water would be taken away through the drainage facilities and the drainage um, um, solutions that were implemented on this property. What the planning commissioners talked about was at finally at the end when all of this drainage stuff was put in is that 
by making the house be tore down and moved over, would that actually fix the draining of this, of this adjoining lot at this time? And the answer is no. So at this point, the drainage issues for this new lot, this adjoining lot, have already been taken care of. And so at this point, approving the setback for this uh, address at 3744 um, makes sense at this point. Um, the drainage issues that the adjoining property owner who came before the city council today, it, it's, it's probably going to be more of a civil suit issue that nothing that the city planning commission or the pl city's public works or even us today can, can help her with or fix. So that's the reason I'm making my motion tonight and um, would recommend my peers to support it. Thank you. And Steve Laurenti. Thank you, Mayor. And if I, if I can, I'd like to ask community planning a question, please, Brett. Yes. In particular. Yes. Mr. Limbaugh, on this particular issue, is, I guess, to your knowledge, the, the neighbors that are negatively affected at this point, has that been resolved from your standpoint? And I'm going to ask the neighbors to come up, too, if they can, please. Well, what I can speak to is what's in front of you, which is the setback. Uh, Planning Commission decided to approve that uh, to go to a lesser setback. Um, it's uh, apparent that uh, they've tried to fix the draining issues uh, by regrading and putting in the pipes. Can I testify that that has actually been effective? I cannot. I have not been in the home. Do we have any uh, awareness of whether there was a drainage issue between these two properties prior to the new construction? You know, I cannot. And uh, another thing to consider is uh, also water table and other issues that may be causing this problem. All right, thank you. Very right. I'm not, I haven't yielded the floor. Oh. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate that. I had some questions for the homeowner, if I can, please. Okay, go ahead. Ma'am, and, and I'm going to ask, Mr., if I have time, or if not, somebody ask uh, Spurlet Consulting, but uh, these same questions, if they can, but I just wanted to know if this was an issue before the new construction. If you can be absolutely honest with me on that particular issue, I would greatly appreciate it. Um, to be perfectly honest, no, it was not an issue. Um, I actually have a photo showing where, um, sorry, I have a lot of photos. Um, um, when our home was built, we were actually the highest property within the line of homes in that area. And the water um, after the home was built next to us, it was actually built up higher than where our property is. So now all the water that sat in the lower two properties now drains down into ours. One more question for you. Mm -hmm. Have they resolved the issue today? If, I mean, it's going to rain in the next couple of days. Is there going to be a water issue? In uh, your it will be damp down there again. Um, Mr. Uh, Weifenbach has come to my property several times and witnessed um, you know, and, uh, how damp it is over there, and um, I'm really sad that I don't, oh, here it is. So, ma'am, do you have a sump pump in your crawl space today? Yes, I have two sump pumps in my crawl space. And um, when that, when it rains, I, I don't know when the most recent rain was, but is that sump pump coming on? Um, it does. It runs properly. Um, Mr. Zanstra's uh, workers have actually come down there and verified that it is pumping properly. And you didn't have these water issues prior to this new construction? No. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate it. If I can, if uh, the gentleman from Spurlet Consulting, I would appreciate okay. his time if he can. And just so you, oh, sorry. Thank okay. you, ma'am. I appreciate it. No problem. Sir, it, it, were you aware whether there was an issue with Drainage, I have a feeling it's going to be a he said, she said situation, but prior to the construction of this pro this, uh I really only got involved with the project after it, this exception needed to happen. The house was built. Um, I can tell you that in our initial meeting, we did, uh, we, we would walk through the that grass area between the houses and out in the backyard, and uh, the picture she just showed with the standing water was in the backyard. That's where the storm sewer went to, that we put the inlets in to take care of that problem. That but, 
Oh. And it was, and the first time they were out there, it was spongy too. There was still standing water, and that's why when we met with the public works staff and the planning staff, that area between the houses was still spongy and it had some spots holding water. That's why we recommended pulling the tops off and regrading it. Okay, thank you very much. And then I have one more last question for Planning Commission, if I can, please. Go ahead. My question is, given the fact that we have uh, this situation, do we see any way of resolving this? I mean, I have a, I really feel for the, the people who own the property who, we can't prove it, but I don't see any reason why she would not tell us the truth about not having uh, water issues um, with her home prior to this. And I just want to make sure that these people are made whole. I mean, if we're going to make an exception for the setback, which puts that home closer to these people, shouldn't they be made whole? That's all my question is for my colleagues. I mean, we need to do this right. If we're going to approve an exception, um, shouldn't we be thinking about those effective, ne effective ne negatively here? Um, and I don't believe that it's changed that, or that there was always drainage issue problems. Um, this is a change. This is an exception we're making for somebody to build closer to another home. So I, I'm just really, I'm really, you know, uh, not happy about the situation for the people who are, you know, um, having to deal with us making an exception and they're not being made whole. And I don't know what the stipulations are, but that's what I was wondering, if the stipulations have anything to do with satisfaction of the drainage issue between the two properties. Is there any, is that part of the stipulations? You know, I think there's certain things that we as staff can do and you as council can do uh, when it comes to looking at this issue, which again is just looking at the setback issue. I don't believe professionally that the setback is the issue affecting the drainage. Now, when it comes to the drainage and fixing um, whatever the, the cause might be, and it could be any number of things, I think that's up to um, the parties who have applied for this, the neighbor, um, the builder, to resolve those issues, whether that's done amicably or in court, it does become a civil issue at some point in time. As a planner, I can't look at the uh, side yard and tell you whether or not that is coming from water table, somebody's overwatering, or whether or not it's storm drainage that's coming off. So, Mr. Lorraine, I, I would have trouble fashioning a stipulation I think would meet your... Yeah, I understand. I get that. I appreciate it. I yield. Richie Nordstrom. Thank you, Mayor. I'm just kind of reading through some of the uh, stipulations on here, and it, there's one that usually comes up for me, and it has to do with the fire uh, accessibility or fire department having accessibility, to be more clear. Um, and I'm not sure who gets this question, but on the setbacks, it, it points out that there's a couple of errors in this. So number one question would be, uh, and I see the fire department is absent, but uh, maybe somebody from the Planning Commission can answer this question, is that uh, the, the setback coming from the fire safety uh, perspective, can, is, are we okay there, mm -hmm. being on f five feet? Mr. Nordstrom, assuming you're directing that to me. If that's all right, Mayor. Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, with respect to fire safety issues and building code issues, um, you can build up to five feet away from somebody's property line with a single family detached home, provided you meet certain building and construction standards. Thank so you. So again, it's not a matter of distance. And, and the other point that the fire department made out, is there's another error on the property north. So I'm just wondering if there is some other additional uh, issues that should be dealt with in this property as well, should, or should be reviewed as well. Um, so have you been acquainted with that particular situation? As this report says, the, on a, is that the structure to the nor north also erred in locating the correct pins on the property. Can well, you Mr. address that? Yeah, Mr. Norsom, if there's another building uh, that does not meet setback, then we'll have to deal with that one as well. Is that what your question is? I believe so, yes. Okay. Thank you. I, I've just got very some serious concerns about this, and it looks like this is turning into a civil issue. Uh, if you have any more uh, problems with this, because my experience with another home up in the North Rapid area, uh, that had to turn into a civil issue as well. Sorry. Thank you. 
Uh, city attorney wants to say something. Does anyone want to ask him a question? Chad Lewis. Mr. Landine, is there something you'd like to add to this discussion? Well, I guess the thing that concerns me at this point is if you don't grant the, the variance, what is the next step? Because I think somebody articulated it, is it tear down the house and start over? I don't think the owner of the property is going to voluntarily do that just because you, you didn't grant the variance. So that would force us then to go into court and seek to have a judge order that the house or at least a portion of it be demolished to comply with the setback. I can tell you there's a case right out of Spearfish where somebody built a deck that encroached and did not comply with building regulations and the neighbor sought to have the deck demolished and the court wouldn't do it. And if they wouldn't, in that case, grant the request, even though it was undisputed that it did not comply with the rules to demolish a deck, I can't imagine they're going to rule to demolish a house. So at some point, these two people are probably going to have to sue each other, and the courts are going to have to sort out. And at that point, the plaintiff is going to have to prove that the water caused the damage or is causing the damage. And if they are, then they're going to be entitled to damages for, for what was caused. And sometimes I think you guys need to recognize that while you want to help people out, you are not always equipped to solve every problem. So at this point, I leave it at that. But again, I would ask you to think if you deny the variance, what do you expect us to do? And is that actually going to accomplish what maybe you hope it accomplishes? Because I think what you'll find is it probably will not. Okay, thanks. We'll go to Jerry Wright. The question I don't know who can answer, but I heard the word sump pump. Is that running at all times? I mean, when it's dry or when it's raining? Only when it's raining? Well, it you, could you go to the microphone, please? Well, it hasn't rained very much recently. Um, most of the original damage was caused during when um, rainwater was coming in through. Um, we have breather vents in the crawl space area, and water was draining directly into that property. And I think it was it's because the adjacent property is up higher than ours, so it drains directly down. So most into of the water there. came in came in from the surface on through drainage channels. Okay. Yes. And then the the water in the yard, that same thing. If it's dry, it goes away. It doesn't. No. Well, no. Um, usually, it's standing. All the time, um, you know, the month of August, we had no rain at all. It was soggy the whole entire time. Um, you know, we have had problems. The adjacent property uh, overwatering. They were watering uh, about three times a day, and usually about uh, 40 minutes per section. Um, we've tried to go reset their sprinkler system for them five times now. And it keeps getting turned back on. So. So the soggy ground, surface ground, was caused by sprinklers. Generally. Yeah. And I think it, you know, with them being so close, their sprinklers are going clear over onto our side. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Essis. Ma'am. Could you <laughs> help me with your first name again, please? The first name is Sherry. Sherry. Yeah. You know, one thing I agree about, this problem wasn't caused by you. Um, you know, it, and, and I can just, I, I see this happen all the time. People, not all the time, but, but developers, uh, you know, you, you develop land and you develop all the lots and, the, and the, 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 the development plan shows general drainage and detention ponds and the, the, the ground slopes and then you turn these lots over to builders and builders go out and first they, you know they'll they got the four corners of the lot and they look at the plan and they they do a string line and and they you got a carpenter somebody that goes and draws out the basement on with red paint and the digger shows up and digs and the concrete guy shows up puts concrete and all of a sudden you know the darn thing's two and a half feet too close so so prop <laughs> And you don't find that out until the well, whole house. We actually I, I'm informed not, I haven't him. Asked, I haven't asked you a question yet. Sorry, go okay. Ahead. 
So, so you don't find out until it's all done because you do the mortgage deal. So, it, so hap accidents do happen. Um, and I don't feel that we're in, a, in the business of, of doing punitive punishment. Now the real question is, is what we have to decide. The question is if we, if we approve the setback from eight to five. And what we have to decide here is, well, does, is, is this much difference? If that house was that much farther away, would, would, would this problem be gone? And, and none of us can prove it. I, I, I think it might help, but I don't think it would be gone. Your water could be surface water. It, um, that part of town has a fairly high gr uh, groundwater. You're on a crawl space, right? Mm -hmm. So it, some of it could be groundwater. Have you ever checked? Did you ch happen to check? Do you have a water softener, a water heater, or anything that had been leaking? No, I don't. Okay, None, so that's been checked. Yes, but but I tell you, that as wet as it's been this year, we've there's been water problems that have crept up all over uh, this town. Um, but I just, you know, the pro problem if we want to get involved so it doesn't happen again is is a hopefully people are more diligent in staking their houses out. But second is 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 the process for people to choose their finished floor level and because it's the last guy that builds wins, you know, because I can show you where I live. They just built a townhouse right next to me and it's five feet higher than mine and all their downspouts go right towards my, you know, and, and, and that's the way uh, right now, that's the way if you build in this town, that's the way it, it is. And uh, the, Finished floor line is either chosen by the carpenter, the housewife, or or the concrete guy, and and then you just and that's about it. So, uh, you know, I this is a terrible deal, but I uh, the bottom line is we're voting on uh, the adjustment of the setback, and I just can't see that denying this two and a half feet of setback cures the water issue, and 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 that's where I stand. Thank you. Amanda Scott. Thank you, Mayor. Three I minutes. Just, I just have three things to cover. I don't think it'll take me three minutes. Number one is the um, fire department's review of this property as far as approving this setback to address um, uh, Councilman Nordstrom's comment is that at the Planning Commission, uh, I believe it was Mr. Tim Billings was there and he said that uh, it had been reviewed and it did meet fire requirements. So there was no concern by the fire department to approve this setback. So that was um, admitted evidence or, or, you know, his statement at the Planning Commission. Um, to address the two other things, number one, the other two issues that were discussed at Planning Commission, um, and I know the planning staff has heard about them, is one is as uh, Alderman Estes has indicated, and that is in this town, the developer lays out the drainage and how the lots are supposed to flow and make sure that every lot is buildable. Um, but then the builders get a hold of it. And so the planning commissioners have talked about this, and it's called, you know, the, lat lo the last lot is the drainage lot. And um, unfortunately, that lot is still a buildable lot according to the development. And so um, one of the things that I believe the planning staff is taking a look at is trying to figure out how we can um, monitor or whose responsibility it is that once a development plan has been submitted to make sure that the builders are held accountable for building according to that development plan so that they don't take the shortcut so that they don't end up building four feet higher than their both property lines on that last lot. So that is one issue that was discussed at the Planning Commission and staff is aware of it. The other one is, um, the other thing that was discussed was when a builder builds and misses the setback, and it wasn't even this case that was being discussed at the Planning Commission, it was another one where the builder had built and missed the mark. And so it had to come before City Council and City Council had to vacate an easement and had to approve the setback change because the builder erred again. And so another, another discussion at the Planning Commission was, and as Alderman Esta said, right now there's no punitive Re, or there's no punitive action for a builder to make a mistake. And so really, I think we have a whole city that is starting to realize, well, I'll just build it and ask for forgiveness later. And so one of the questions I have is, do we, 
is that really where we want to continue with this? And that's the question that was posed before the Planning Commission. So I believe staff is like taking a look at that as well is because, unfortunately, I didn't think there were very few, few of these cases. I didn't think there were very many of these cases. I thought there were just a few of these cases where the builders were um, making these errors. I was corrected numerous times at the Planning Commission that, no, this is more frequent than a few times. So it seems to be that it's becoming a lot more prevalent. So just wanted to pass on those things. I'm sorry, Mayor, I yield the floor. Okay, Jerry Wright. Along with what Councilman Scott said, I think that we do a strict job of requiring that the engineers do the layout preliminary and final platting, and that's when we walk away and it's cut loose, isn't it? And maybe that's something we need to look at is what should we do next or should we to assure that things are done in compliance with the plans. And I think that's a big issue. It's a lot like our expansive soil issue that we wrestled with that was ignored for probably 60 years. So further discussion, I'm sure. Thank you. Chad Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just would like to say that um, I'm not sure that it's fair to say that this is frequently happening and all the builders are just building and asking for forgiveness later. As Mr. Estes said, mistakes do happen. No, you didn't. She did. As Mr. Estes said, mistakes do happen and it's, you know, and in deciding if it's if it's acceptable to, to prove this is what we're talking about here. We're not talking about all this other stuff you guys have been babbling on about here for the next 20 minutes. So the fact of the matter is we're here to, are we doing an appeal? Are we proving it or not? Move on. I mean, and, and we shouldn't be questioning taking businesses individually and, and talking about them like this either up here. I really don't, I don't appreciate that either. Mr. Zanstra generally has a pretty good reputation, I think, and I don't think we should uh, be attacking that either. Thank you. Okay, the motion on the floor is to approve um, with stipulations. All in favor of that motion say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. No. One no from Steve Laurenti. Item number 62 is the bill list. City Finance Officer Pauline Sumption. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. There are no changes to the bill list, so the total is that which is before you at $7,169,243.82. Moved to approve by Drew and then Lewis. Uh, all in favor of that, say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion to adjourn by Drew. Second. Second by Amanda. All in favor, say aye. Aye. We're adjourned. Aye.